You're listening to Got Tech, the podcast with your hosts, Eric Geis and Nick Johnson. Welcome back to Got Tech, the podcast. This is episode 71 called Making Students Content Creators During a Pandemic. In this episode, we'll review some of the ways that students can be content creators in your classroom. Following that, we'll dive into some exciting tech tools that help to make this possible in a remote hybrid or in-person classroom. This is another episode you don't want to miss. Check it out. All right, welcome back, everybody. It's uh, episode 71. Nick, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling good. It's a rainy day outside, but we've been getting a lot of good work done and making a lot of progress here in school. So it's uh, it's sort of nice to, to see some, you know, everything, all of our projects progressing and sitting down to do another episode record. Yeah, so a lot of it has been going on, and we keep saying this, but every week it's something new, and we're tackling a new issue, a new problem. And this is actually today's topic. It, is something that I've discussed with other edu podcasters and other educators in the field. And uh, it's actually, this episode is something that got triggered by a conversation that I had with uh, Ask the Tech Coach with Jeff uh, Bradbury. And really, I thought that we could just take a different angle at this and kind of use the same thing. But if you want a similar conversation, you could check out Ask the Tech Coach on uh, Monday, November 2nd. I think that's when that episode's coming out. And I was lucky enough to be a guest on there. But we're going to take a little different approach and we're going to focus on the students where Ask the Tech Coach typically focuses on the teachers and supporting the teachers through some type of change. So today is all about students being the content creators. And really what brought this up this week is well, over the last couple of weeks, we've been getting a lot of questions about grading. How do you grade during the pandemic? I'm trying to give a test. I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to do that. And for me, the answer is simple. You, you change the way the classroom is ran. You change what grades look like. You change how we assess kids. And, and basically making them content creators will do that. Yeah, because, you know, the big issue that a lot of us are having now is, you know, if I give a traditional assessment to uh, uh, my hybrid classroom, first of all, and, and I've done it, they're all open notes, which means they can look up any information they want. They're not supposed to work with each other, but technically nothing is stopping them from pulling up their phones on the side and texting answers back and forth. And there's some ways to control that. But, you know, a really powerful way is to sort of like I started introduces, maybe get away from that traditional assessment assessment style and and force your students as the assessment to create something, something that is unique, something that, you know, they're allowed to look up whatever information they want, but they can't fake it and they can't cheat on it because they really have to demonstrate their understanding in creating that thing. So grading is one of the big challenges there. And it's it's a tough shift for teachers to make. I know that I still sort of feel uncomfortable in it. You're sort of like, well, no, they have to take a test. They have to answer multiple choice questions or they have to respond to this one short answer I've been asking for 10 straight years. But do they? You you know, maybe try one, you know, alternative style assessment where they record a video instead and see what kind of information that gives you. You might find you actually even like it more than something else. Absolutely. And and like you said, it's hard to fake something that you have to produce. Yeah, you could fake something if you're doing, I don't know, like anything where you're just filling in the blank, doing something like that. But if you try to get your students to podcast, you can't fake that. If they're saying, um, um, and, and, and stuff like that, it's because they're not prepared. They don't know what they're going to say. And uh, it's very, in podcasting land, it's very common for people to drop an and and um to gather their thoughts but the thing is is with students if they did their homework if they did their research they're going to be able to speak freely about that and really i would challenge you to challenge them to push everything out through narrative form make a backstory right george washington was probably feeling like this because let's think about the events that were going on around them during this time all right that's drawing people in and that's a valuable skill because no matter what skill out there in the real world you need to know how to use narrative it's part of every job it's part of building relationships it's part of teaching and it's it's really just part of life so i would argue that this might be more beneficial and more impactful than taking a test which they will take and then they'll forget 
70 percent of the information before you even start the next unit yeah that's the other benefit is we all know you always remember the projects from school more than the tests i don't remember one single test but i remember many many different projects that i worked on throughout high school and any even college and they get a lot more out of it long term besides those life skills and um so we think it can solve the grading problem there's lots of other challenges that are going to go along with this like time uh, but some of these things you know it might still take a class period or less which is equivalent to or less than what it would have taken to do that traditional test anyway. You'll run into other things of if you are in a, say, hybrid environment or maybe your kids are fully back in school, but you're still trying to socially distance. You're going to have some challenges there, but hopefully by now you've figured out some ways to sort of space students out. Uh, if you do have a remote classroom, just that long distance aspect is tough in and of itself. Uh, but we think some of the tools that we sort of collected for you guys today are things that can be used no matter where students are. They can for sure be used if everybody's in the classroom together. And we think we've got some ways that they can even be used, you know, if, if people are, are uh, separate from home and just working over Zoom or some other digital meeting format like that. You can follow Got Tech outside the podcast at gottech.com or on Twitter at we got Tech. So as we get into these tools, we will tell you a little bit about the tool. Uh, some of these you might have heard before, but hopefully we come with a new perspective of how you can use those. Others you might not have heard before, and hopefully that inspires you and uh, has you thinking about how you can use it in your classroom. So some of the tools that we'll uh, get into will address things like podcasts, videos, screencasts, even uh, just visual media like creating images, stuff that you could post or at least say that you would post online like an Instagram account or Facebook page or something else like that. Uh, and, and with all of them, the focus here is going to be on uh, collaboration, letting the students work with each other. And even though that is sort of how we pulled this list together with that idea of collaboration, collaboration in mind. Any of these, of course, could be used singularly as well by just one student. So if you're trying to replace some sort of an alternative assessment with one of these things, obviously it's going to work for that too, but we really hope to hit on that collaboration aspect of it as well. So I think that's a pretty good introduction. Is it time for us to get into this list of tools? Yeah, I believe so. All why, right. Why don't you start us off? Yeah, I'll, I'll kick it off. And this is one we bring up a lot and, and chances are if you're listening to this show, you probably have heard of it, but I always, it's one of those tools that we always go back to and we like, and we don't really mind mentioning over and over again because it's just that good. And at least for me, I feel like I'm constantly learning new things about it and new things that you can do. I'm talking about We Video. Uh, we Video is sort of like the ultimate collaborative space for creating and editing videos. Um, and that's sort of what separates it from pretty much anything else that I've seen or used that's out there where it is designed where you you know multiple students can work on and edit a video uh, not exactly simultaneously but they can all be assigned to the same project work on it together from different places so in a you know this sort of weird pandemic world th this is something that you're definitely going to want to use the downside to it is that you do have to pay for the service but it is definitely worth reaching out to your administrator or your supervisor and seeing if it's something that your school would support having because it's just in incredibly awesome yeah and there is a freemium with uh, we video that you could go try and the watermark in the bottom right hand corner is not a big deal but i will tell you this uh, if you offer your students a tool like we video and you say that they can use it a lot of times you'll get students that will come up and be like hey i want to use this instead and i always tell them go for it as long as i get the final product go for it and then other times i'm like no i want you to use we video and i do that at least once throughout the year usually it's the first project because once they realize how easy it is to use i never get any of those uh questions can i use this can i use this instead uh so i would strongly represent we video in my classroom for that ultimate creator tool. Yeah, and it, well, that's a great point. And then just to sort of build on some of the things you can do with it. I mean, yeah, it's for editing videos, but I mean, you can pull together anything with this. If you want to record, it'll record your voice. It has a recording feature uh, where you just click record and start talking into your laptop and it records your audio straight into the audio track. Uh, it has a screencasting tool. So anybody out there that's tried using, say, Screencastify, and maybe you're not super happy with the editing that's available to 
you afterwards, you can do that in Wii Video and just add that recorded screencast straight into into the tool and, and edit it from there or don't and just, you know, or push it out and save it to one of the many ways that you can. So I always I always like to bring that up because when you, I think a lot of people sort of shut down when you hear Wii Video, maybe you just know, oh yeah, that's that editing tool and I've seen a couple classes use it, but it can do so much more than that. Um, even as you can even just use it as an audio recording tool alone if you wanted to, uh, where the students just choose like an image as a background and they record their voice over top, which sort of gets close to that podcast creation we were talking about before. So uh, that's just some of the things it can do and the collaborative nature makes this one of my one of my favorite things out there right now. Yeah, one thing that I've been doing lately is I've been trying to learn easy ways to edit images to make them look, I don't know, more professional, more presentable and put them in formats in which I think they're just easier to read. They're nicer looking and things like that. We've talked about, you know, Canva so many times. We've talked about using Google, uh, help me out, help me out. Oh, Google Drawings? Thank you. Yeah, there you Google go. Google Drawings. <laughs> I'm having a case of the Fridays on yeah. a Thursday. Yep. Uh, but yeah, so Google Drawings, we've we've talked about those, but there are some quality extensions out there that I like to use in order to, I don't know, make something visually represented a little bit better. And I'm actually thinking of ways of decorating my office because, you know, Nick and I got a new office at work and I absolutely have nothing but white walls and a Hope Ball Valley flag on it. That's it. So what I'm trying to do is I'm try- I, w- I want something to represent my family in there. They're very important to me. So I am working with the extension online photo collage maker and it's allowing me to kind of have these templates of collages. I'm not spending a whole lot of time on it, but I, I do have, you know, 10 or 15 pictures that make me happy when I look at my family. So I'm using online photo collage maker. You could easily use that in the classroom to represent. Maybe you're doing an intro lesson to the next unit and you want them to find 10 images to represent the 10 major topics in this unit by looking at you know, guided notes or this intro video or anything like that. Come up with a visual representation. So once they have all those photos on there, maybe the assignment is that they exchange it with somebody else And based on pictures alone, they had to try to guess what those 10 pictures represented as a review activity before you do some main assessment. So I'm going to take yours and sort of let that lead into mine, a little uh, segue connection here. So I'm thinking I'm going to use this online photo collage maker as one aspect of my project or my assessment where they have to pull together, let's say, four students in a group. So four images in in a nice, simple photo collage. And, you know, for me in the science world, those images have to be representative of some sort of scientific phenomena. So right now my chemistry classes are studying. It's called intermolecular forces, which is just how particles basically stick to each other. Do they stick together very strongly or weakly? And this connects and this explains to lots of like properties that you can observe in almost everything in everyday life. So I want them to find me those images, put it together in a photo collage maker, and then uh, use that image as the backdrop to a video that is their narration of what's happening in terms of the chemistry to explain the phenomena in those images. And they're going to do it with a tool uh, that I have used a lot in the past called Headliner. You might remember, this is going back, geez, many, many months, but we have brought this up on the show before. Headliner is a tool that's used often by like professional podcasters to share clips of their show. You can even use it now for entire shows, but generally clips of your show online. So on Instagram, where you've got that one minute uh, time limit for a video clip, and even though they extended that recently, uh, there's still like the standard one minute time limit. You know, you can do that in Headliner and choose a nice background for your video, add in your audio clip of your podcast over top. For my students, of course, since the podcast is not part of this, it's just going to be an audio clip of them explaining these images. And it, and it looks really nice. It looks really professional. You may follow some accounts where you've seen this, um, where it's almost like you get that little, I believe it's called an audiogram. It's like that visual representation of the audio clip itself, right laid over top of the background image. And it just is a really nice, cool sort of final, uh, like polished final product. Uh, The downside to Headliner is that you can't edit it simultaneously like you could do in WeVideo where multiple students can get in there and work. Um, But I kind of think that's okay as long as you instruct the students the proper way in this, they can, you know, once they can separate jobs. One person creates the background image. Everybody sends different audio clips to you know, one person who's in charge of editing it together in the headliner. So even these tools where you can't 
work simultaneously on one project, there are ways that you can have students contribute equally while one person sort of does the the final accumulation of all that stuff. So I think that could be a pretty cool way to build some uh, digital content. I love how you use that for something that is not typically its traditional purpose. Uh, I always love when we uh, bring up some type of tool and we're able to figure out a unique way of using that tool. All right, so the next one kind of blew my socks off. I, I We were at a professional development before the pandemic and um, Nick's like, hey, uh, you got the remote control for the presentation. I was like, <laughs> no, I thought you grabbed the remote control for the presentation. And uh, our buddy Kyle Nemus came out and said, hey, don't worry about it. You could use your uh, any device that you want as long as it's like a Google slide presentation, which it is. And it's an extension called remote for slides. Um, so slide presentations are still a thing when you give professional development. And typically when we do professional development, we like to make it interactive or some big narrative that's driving that and we don't like to be strapped to our computers in there so if you use remote for slides this is an extension that allows you to use your phone or whatever you want to advance the slides and become that presentation tool that you need uh, to basically give you a little bit of freedom to move around yeah that's it's a great tool and i'm, I'm glad you brought up too that you know presentations just creating a slide or, or a slide deck that's still a very real thing i mean we get pretty deep these days into videos and podcasts and all this stuff it's it still exists in the world where you might have to create a slides based presentation and that I, it's helpful to go back to that the nice part about it today is that there's so many ways that you can make it better like remotes for slides where you control it with your phone so you can sort of you know move around and be anywhere in the room. So that's that's definitely worth mentioning here. Um, another one that I'll bring up too is is called Storyboard. That this is one of my favorite tools. I've been using it literally since I started teaching, um, and my use of it has kind of grown. And including this time during uh, the pandemic, where you know Storyboard. That I guess I should back up. It's a storyboard creator. It lets you add in like sort of pre-designed backgrounds and little cartoon characters and you can add text bubbles. It's it's really great. Basically generating just that, a storyboard or a comic strip and you can illustrate anything with it. You know, a scientific process, a historical event, whatever you want. So the students can generate this. It is not built for collaboration. Only one person can make one storyboard at a time. However, uh, what I have started doing is assigning groups of students and they have to work together in a Zoom breakout room and they each edit a small chunk of a cumulative storyboard. Uh, and when they're done and they create it and they download the image file, or I've, I've just been having them actually use their like their screen snipping tool to just sort of grab an image. Well, they take the, the screen snipped image of their storyboard, throw those into a Google drawing, and they can adjust the size of that drawing. And now these you know storyboard squares are together in a collaborative environment. So Every student in that group can edit them, move them around, put them in different order. And, and you made something that was not super collaborative now into a collaborative space where they can arrange that, arrange that storyboard however they want and even add additional things to it within that Google drawing platform. So that's, I, it's a, I, I wanted to make sure to mention that today just to uh, sort of let everyone know that you can often think creatively about tools that aren't built for collaboration, but there's almost always a way where you can sort of work around that and let students still work together. And I think that's a creative one. Yeah, I know that a lot of us are still remote completely. They're not in a hybrid or in-person situation. So I could see you giving this type of assignment to kids to work on asynchronously, but then bringing it back to the group and maybe choosing three or four of them throughout the period for students to look at uh, and kind of break down and use it as a discussion piece on Zoom or uh, Google Meet or something like that. So I, I, I love that one. I love anything that has to do with narrative and getting the, th the students to think about how they can represent something with a background story to it. All right, so my next one, it's really a cluster of tools here. Um, what we use to edit our podcast, what we use to edit our podcast is Audacity. And uh, Audacity is for uh, Macs, it's for PCs, you could use it on an iPad, but when it comes to Chromebooks, we kind of all get the shaft there. There's, there's, there's absolutely uh, 
nothing like audacity out there so i thought i started to look and now there's an extension called audio editor online audacity with telegram i mean it's a mouthful but it its function is way more simple than the, its name so if you just go in you type in audacity with telegram it will also come up but it's an audio editor it allows you to record edit and uh, it has a lot of different effects that you could add to it in order to have your students podcast. And this is something that is near and dear to us because we are now in the thick of getting students to come up with their own podcasts. I have my AP Bio class doing an AP Bio podcast as uh, part of their review where each student gets to their own topic. They have to speak for five to seven minutes on that topic, bringing in definitions, real world examples, and how it connects into a bigger picture. And they're, they're having a good time doing it, at least the couple that I talked to about it, because this is still a new assignment. The couple that I talked about are really enjoying it, so we'll probably continue this on. But the one thing I like about it is they use simple tools to get this done. All right, I had them use Sodaphonic, some use Twisted Wave. Some of them use voice memos on their phone and just had their headphones in. And you know what? The audio is perfectly fine. And then uh, when they hand in that audio segment, uh, I, I got uh, one song that I put at the, the front end of it and the back end of it. And it sounds awesome. It sounds professionally done. And I think it's something that they're going to be proud of. I know I'm proud of it because they did a, such a phenomenal job. But So audio er, Audacity with Telegram. Sodaphonic and Twisted Wave. Those are three very good extensions in online programs. I got a couple comments about that. First of all, we love Audacity. It's how we've been editing all of our shows from the very beginning. Uh, it's free, free download. And finally now you can do it on Chromebooks too. And as much as I love Audacity, what a, what a terrible name that is for their extension, right? Audio Editor Online Audacity with Telegram way too long yeah i'm not sure if they actually made it i think it's the closest thing that looks like audacity on an extension uh, yeah we'll yeah, have I, to look at that but right uh it does look like almost the same exact interface right but i think yeah you're probably right that's not like the actual name that's just the correct combined version of all the tools that make this possible but super exciting I also want to mention that uh, I, I was around when, you know, your class was doing uh, some of this podcasting project and I saw something that's maybe the first time I've seen it and it's one of the higher level sort of, um, you know, student objectives. I forget the exact framework that this comes from, but getting your students to the point where they can now look up, find, research, and learn how to use their own tools. You know, you may have instructed them to use Sodaphonic or whatever it is, but I specifically saw groups of students that knew how to search for Chrome extensions and add them, and they were finding their own tools to use and asking if that was okay. And like you mentioned earlier, of course it's okay, and actually that is fantastic and sort of the point where you want kids to be in this 21st century world. Yeah, so w what you're describing there is the SAMR model, but it's also the model that we're actually switching to, which is the technology integration matrix. All right, so we said this before, but the technology integration matrix is awesome. Go check it out. It's uh, FCIT, I think, is the website it comes from. We could put that in the show notes. But uh, basically, it's, it's SAMR across the top, but they split the R, the redefinition, into two different categories and as you work from left to right left is more teacher centered and as you go to the right it's more student centered but that's what we're kind of looking at there we're talking about this uh, redefinition piece of SAMR where students are able to kind of advocate for themselves choose their own tools guide their own learning to reach some type of educational purpose or goal so you know I'm glad you brought that up because we don't always connect those um, to what we're doing but uh, definitely check out the technology integration matrix. They have a lot of examples on there of, of certain examples that fit in with each one of the little matrices that are that goes along with it. Yeah, I mean, we, it was neat to to see because we've talked about the that matrix before, but it's kind of tough to, especially in a podcast, explain it. But then to see it happening, you know, actually happening in real life, where the students just start 
learning that, hey, I can look for my own things and then use them. It was, it was just nice. So I, I wanted to bring it up. Um, my next tool is, is again, sort of a repeater, but hopefully with a twist. And that is uh, for recording, well, you know, really recording your screen that is being narrated. I'm talking Screencastify, recording screencasts. Not the best for collaboration, although there are some ways to do it. This week, we've been doing a lot of work where there's a special type of microphone you can hook up to the computer. Um, and there's lots of them that'll do this, but this particular one is called a snowball mic. So in terms of collaboration, if you have small groups of students in school, uh, the snowball mic can pick up sound from anywhere in the room. There's multiple settings and one of them is to do that. So you can properly social distance your students and they can be, uh, you know, six feet away on opposite sides of a table and all talking and all recording into the same Screencastify session. So that's just one of the things I wanted to bring up. If you do have some in-person capabilities, uh, if you don't, and you didn't know this, when you record a screencast, uh, that video is automatically added to your Google Drive in a Screencastify folder. That's sort of the default. But you can go into the settings and, and check the show notes because we have a tutorial there on how to do this. It's not ours, but something I found somewhere else. Um, you can set it so that those videos also go other places. And one of them that they can integrate with is Wakelet. So if you set up a, a Wakelet collection, you can have your class videos or student, you know, by group videos go to a Wakelet collection so that now all the students can not only view those, but maybe even, you know, use that as a way to share and have access to each other's clips so they can use them for other things. Maybe then editing them in a different program like we video. Uh, I think that's a neat way to sort of bring collaboration in is to have your screencasts from Screencastify get sent straight to Wakelet and sort of as a as an add-on to that this is I'm not sure if this is a new feature but it's new to me uh, last year I think it was in the spring Screencastify started offering at the time it was their the beta version of their editor which means after you record that screencast there actually is some ways that you can edit the video you can snip out little you know clips and and delete them you can add text and other stuff it's still pretty limited but it is getting better uh, one of the options now in the screencastify editor is to actually add multiple video clips so that means if my students are not in person and they can't record on the exact same screencast you could have each student in the group record a different component, and then one of those students is responsible for pulling all of them together and combining them into one giant video that they can submit. It's really simple, and you could just show your class how to open. There's like an open in editor button, and then when they go there, there's a little blue plus sign, and all they have to do is click the blue plus sign. It'll open up their Google Drive, and they just have to click uh, the other video clip that they want to add in, and now you're taking and bringing those multiple video clips together. And it's a nice way that you can, you know, get at least some elements of that collaboration while creating that screencast final product. Yeah, a lot of good stuff there. I did not know about the uh, the multiple videos into Screencastify. So that that's definitely very valuable. Uh, I do like the fact that you brought up Wakelet and how you could add those uh, Screencastify videos to Wakelet. I will tell you one thing that I've been using with Wakelet is I've been having students post videos to Wakelet. I'm working with a couple teachers on on doing this because they want they're uh, they're teaching from home, and they want their students to be able to access other students' work and comment on it. So what we've been doing is putting these screencasts on a Wakelet board that is private to only people with link, a link, which is the class members. And then they're under each uh, video that is uploaded, you can insert a comment or a text box there. So what we've been doing is saying, okay, if your name's Johnny, you'll put Johnny at the front and then you'll leave your comment. And that's how you get credit for it. So that's another way that you can kind of bring that collaborative piece in there from remote or hybrid land of uh, teaching. So I'll get the last one out here. And this is one we brought up before. And I, I really like it because I can turn out a, uh, some type of digital poster within 30 seconds. Uh, so it's called Pablo. It's an extension. You go find an image on the internet that you like. You could go to Google and type in backgrounds or nature or anything like that. Grab that picture, open it up in Pablo. So when you have that extension, a little P will show up on that picture. You click on it, it takes that image, puts it into Pablo, and then you could put any type of text that you want over top of it. And then you hit uh, export or download or share, 
and you can easily send that image or or whatever that digital document is out to wherever you want whether it's social media whether it's to your classroom whether you want to just have it as a background on your your computer whatever it may be and it's it's super easy to do like a quote of the day if you wanted to do make your best practices uh zoom best practices an image uh you could easily do that um, and put the best practices over top of an image and then have that as your zoom background if your device supports that but pablo is one of those ones that does something very easily it's a very simple tool but it does it really well yeah, Pablo is an, an old favorite, and I'm excited to be able to bring that back for today's episode. And that I think that also pretty much wraps it up. We got that's a that's a good list of stuff, and I've I've just seen so many really incredible things happening in not not just our classrooms, but all the all the teachers in our school being sort of thrust into this technology rich environment. And and the stuff that's coming out of it is really cool. Uh, at the very least, for sure, the students are are way more comfortable in that space and learning and researching and doing their own things. And hopefully with some of the stuff that we shared with you guys today, you can sort of push that even further. So let's close it out and just talk briefly about where you guys can find more from Got Tech the Podcast if you're interested. Uh, I'm going to share this out, even though I haven't cleared it with you yet, although we do it every year, so I'm pretty sure it's going to be fine. I'm talking, of course, about the NJECC conference. It happens every fall, and it's happening this fall too, but of course in a new uh, digital format. Uh, so you can look for Geis and I to most likely be presenting there. It's one of our favorite conferences, and I'm sure that the digital experience is going to be just as great i'm pretty and i really wanted to mention it because you know mostly we get new jersey new york connecticut pennsylvania people attending but now uh, you can sign up and attend this from anywhere and i think you know i think you guys will get a lot out of it it's always one of our uh, one of our favorites uh other stuff that we've mentioned recently got tech tip Got Tech Tool today. That's our new YouTube series. We're trying to push out a video or two a week. Anytime we find something cool, we post it on YouTube as, as a source for you guys to watch and listen to. And then some other recent stuff that I just wanted to bring up again. The New Jersey Department of Education has a virtual professional learning website with tons of great resources. One of those is Geis and I presenting a bunch of different tech tools for virtual teachers. Also the Dino Progressive Learning Conference. You can find that on YouTube. Uh, our show notes have links to all of these things so you can go there or just type type it into your google search bar and find it that way as well as just you know do the typical subscribe anywhere you listen to the show subscribe there like us write us a review would be the absolute best thing or the ver very simplest version just uh just tell your friends if you're learning some good stuff from the show or from our youtube channel or anywhere just from our website or our blog posts spread the word man let people know about got tech the podcast and got tech.com Thanks for listening to Got Tech, the podcast. Remember to subscribe to our show and follow us at We Got Tech on Twitter so you can stay up to date with the latest episode releases, blog posts, product reviews, and PD announcements. You can also follow Geis and I individually at Geis Got Tech and at Nick Got Tech on Twitter or on Instagram at Nick Got Tech. Finally, remember to check out our website, gottech.com, where we post all our episodes, articles, and resources available to you for free. Until next time.